Sorry guys, we have a little technical problem, okay? And uh, yeah, as soon as uh, Pedro comes back, yes. There we go. Okay. Better now? Can you hear me? I turned my phone off and took forever. <laughs> <Turn back on. laughs> I'm not that this, this thing is a little bit too modern for me, amigo. <laughs> so, anyway, going back to the, you know, the beginning, amigo. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read again because I think uh, every, everything, now that everyone say it was bad, I, I want to read again that uh, what I read before because... Uh, we lost all of these, and I want to make sure that it's recorded, Pedro. Okay. Okay. Oh, let me get my our oh, reading glass now. See? <laughs> Pedro Sauer. The Grandmaster Pedro Sauer, the world's favorite jiu-jitsu teacher, has been trained jiu-jitsu for almost 50 years, taking under the wing of the Grandmaster Helio Gracie. He was a young boy. He was considerate. ADD, and in and out of hospitals for mental health. But Grandmaster Elio Gracie was the first one to believe in him and tell him and tell that he wasn't crazy. It was from that moment on that Jiu-Jitsu changed his life. Pedro talks with us about the power of Jiu-Jitsu in life and how it teaches us to resolve stress and become comfortable in our own skin. This message has never been more relevant than right now. Thank you for all your inspiration and friendship. Always. Jiu-Jitsu practitioners worldwide will together overcome. Pedro, for those, I don't know, I think those words describe so much um, about who you are, how, how incredible the art of jiu-jitsu, then a lot, of, a lot of times I think people in today's time missing pieces very important of the time that you learn jiu-jitsu. Mm -hmm. And we see that more and more every day, and especially right now that we need to use jiu-jitsu outside the mat. And exactly. I'm sure a lot of people there are never had that privilege or opportunity to learn from a jiu-jitsu master like you. Going back on your early days of jiu-jitsu, Pedro, well, tell us because it's an incredible story that I have no doubt so many people today will relate it to. And a lot of people that have kids, with a lot of things that they discovered today, not knowing that the best medication for that would be jiu-jitsu. And you Without are, a doubt. You proof that jiu-jitsu can cure a lot more things that people realize. Yep, I agree. Yeah. I mean, well, for... well, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you, Pedro. It's uh, someone that I want to talk in a long time and has so much, so much knowledge to, to teach all of us. Thank you, amigo. I really appreciate you, Jacques. You've always been a great representative, a great guy. I still remember you, a young little guy. Even though we kind of might have a little difference age-wise, I think I hide my age pretty good. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm... I'm oh, I don't know about that. No, I'm going to 62. So, that, you know, I'm a, born in 58. And uh, I, I did start jiu-jitsu. Uh, first time that I saw Jiu Jitsu in my life, I was just a young kid. But I didn't follow, I didn't pursue uh, training. Uh, my sister used to date one of uh, Elio Grace's students. His name was Robert Cardin. And uh, he used to teach me some moves in, in the, in the, at home. And uh, what happened for me, Jean Jacques, is that when I was a kid, I grew up, thought, I, I had a complete understanding, and I used to believe that I was crazy. Uh, people used to call me crazy all the time. And, and I end up believing. I end up agreeing and believing that I was crazy. So I did some unbelievable crazy stuff. Uh, I've been in 12 different schools. 
I got I got expelled from every school that I studied uh, before jiu-jitsu. Every single school. I was never been a, a somebody who was aggressive or wants to fight people, but I was super, super hyper. I could not stop still one second. And um, here I did a, a, a all kind of ex. Uh, you know, I used to go to Brazil. I don't know if you're familiar. Casa de Saúde, Doutor Eiras. Yeah, yeah, I know where it is. Yes, yes. I spent one year, one year of my life, going every day to Casa de Saúde, Doutor Eiras, to do electrical uh, exams with electrical shocks. And uh, I was a complete nutcase. I gotta be honest with you. I was a nutcase. I started driving a car when I was eight years old. Man, At ten years old, I was already drifting cars. <laughs> When I was 12, I was doing things in cars that uh, adults could not, understand, could not believe. And at 15, I bought my, I bought my own car. I'm going to tell a quick story that I, I've been keeping this quiet for a long time. Look, you, I want you to say everything that you feel, <laughs> you know, because I know we talk now from the heart. Yep. You Please. just open up because I can, see, I can see how jiu-jitsu changed my life. And I, I'm pretty sure it would change a lot of people's life too, without a doubt. So that's why I never give up on people. Uh, uh, when I was a kid one time, I was 16 years old. And a, a friend of mine got uh, his mom's car. And somehow we decided to go uh, to race. And it was five cars on, on, on the race, on the track. Well, I ended up rolling over the car, roll over, like, you know, flipping the car. And guess who was the guy who picked me up inside the car? It was Hickson. <laughs> <laughs> We're just little kids, 15 years old. 15 years old. I rolled over this car so many times. Uh, that was incredible. And I, I didn't have one scratch. When, I, when, my, when my door opened, well, the door was open. The car was no doors. Uh, I lost the doors of the car. It was a complete disaster. The first face that I saw was Hickson. <laughs> and he picked me up put me in the car and we took off and we went back to call the parents, you know, for them to take the responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> so that's 15 years old, completely out of my mind, driving cars and, you know, believe it or not, Jean -Jacques, at that moment on, I learned how to put the car in two wheels. Man. And, uh, you know, that, that thought that, uh, you know, I'm, sometimes I think about it today, my gosh, what have I done? What, I couldn't believe I was doing that kind of stuff. But, uh, I'm, glad man, you have, I'm glad you have good guardian angels. I have some. My guardian angel cannot blink the eyes. I don't think he never blinked the eyes. I never went to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so but going back to the early days, you know, growing up in a family, you know, my family was a big family, too. I came from uh, six brothers and sisters and uh, many cousins. And uh, I used to hang out with a lot of friends. And uh, right in the beginning, my sister was dating um, a guy who was a professional boxer. His name was Marcio Matar. And uh, he took me to the, to the Santa Rosa, uh, you know, Box Academy, Santa yeah. Rosa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. That was the worst thing. <laughs> you know, I was super aggressive. And you go and you sign me up in a boxing gym. So I was like a... <laughs> I was completely crazy. You know, I was the only white kid. Do you ever heard about a, a guy's name, Chiquinho de Jesus? Yeah. The boxer? Yes. Man, Chiquinho de Jesus, and, and we had a match, and he beat the crap of me. Uh, 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 like, a, he, like you know, who was the white kid over there? Crazy kid, I want to fight him. So Chiquinho de Jesus, he, he just, just, just mauled me. But anyway, that was my beginning. And the other, other part that I did as a martial arts, I did a little bit of Taekwondo. And um, I done Taekwondo uh, for about two and a half years. And uh, I test for yellow belt with Marco Ruas. Man, okay. <laughs> we, ended, we used to be neighbors, me and Marco. We used to, came from the same neighborhood, you know? Flamengo. And Marco used to, is one, he was younger than five brothers. Uh, it was unbelievable brothers. And Zezé, one of his brothers, was a great friend of mine. And Marco was uh, maybe a couple years younger than me, but super talented. One of the nicest guys you're ever going to meet in your life, Marco Ruas. And uh, so anyway, I did Taekwondo, I did boxing, I did judo, 
And judo I did for about a couple years. Uh, I did judo in Laranjeiras with uh, Professor Aroldi. That was the name of the academy. Uh, Ricardo Americano came from the academy. Uh, that place. Yeah, do you remember the Ricardo Americano? And uh, um, Alex, uh, Alexander came from that place too. We've got a whole bunch of people that came there. Very nice school. But uh, me and my brother one time, we tackled. Uh, the guy who used to take us there was my mom's uh, driver, uh, a chauffeur. And used to take us there. His name was, uh, uh, oh my goodness, I got it. Gilberto. Gilberto. That's the guy's name, Gilberto. <laughs> so one, one time, me and my brother, Carlos, we tackled Gilberto and we broke his arm. <laughs> so we lost our ride <laughs> to judo. So we stopped training judo. And after that, I, was, uh, I, I left one school, Zacarias. And uh, I got kicked out from Zacarias. I got expelled. And I went to study in Ateneu São Luís. It was in a school in Catete, in Flamengo. Well, when I got there, guess who was the first guy who was in my classroom taking my spot? It was crawling. Crawling. Oh, man. Crawling was in my seat. <laughs> Remember in the early days, like, hey, this is my place. This is my seat. My name is over there. You know, we all pretty, pretty much pretend we're tough, you know? So I look at Crawl and say, hey, this is my seat. Move. Crawl looked at me very quietly, got his stuff, and moved to other seats. Didn't say a word. And uh, later the teacher said, Crawl and Grace. I said, Crawl and Grace? I, what, what? So I kind of heard the name Grace, but I didn't know nothing about it. And Crawl one day, we, we started playing. Crawl was a great guy. He, he toyed with me, too. That's, I got to say, honest, I got to say thank you to, to Crawl because, my goodness, I was such a pain in the ass. I used to bug him so much. And one time he just flipped me, put me in, a, in the stomach. I couldn't move. I couldn't do nothing. And Crawley started to tell, tell, uh, talk to me about jiu-jitsu. I was like, ah, jiu-jitsu, I don't know what it is. I do boxing. Come here, I'll punch in the face. You know, kid stuff, 14, 15 years old. Well, uh, uh, when, when I was in the street, uh, growing up on the street in Flamengo, I see this guy walking every single day uh, with his dog, uh, some German shepherd. And this guy used to pass and just keep looking at us, looking at us, and say anything. And that was Hickson. So one time I see this guy pass and I look at him and say, hey, what the hell are you looking at, man? You keep looking at here. So Hickson came out kind of quiet. Hey, how you doing, guys? What do you guys do over there? I said, man, I keep, look, I keep seeing you passing every day. Just keep checking us up. So, what, so Hickson started hanging out in our group of guys. And I have no clue about Jiu-Jitsu. So Hickson asked me to go to the academy. I was probably 15, 16 years old. I go to the academy, I go there, and I, I saw Hickson training with a purple belt. Hickson was, was wearing a green belt. He's still in a kid's belt. And he was training against a purple belt. And when I saw the train, I'm going to be honest, tell you, I could not believe what, what's going on over there. And I told him, Hickson, I'm never going to do something like that. This is crazy. You guys are out of your mind. I cannot believe you have not broke your neck yet. You just climb up the walls and flip it backwards. And, man, it was a, a show as a little kid. So it took me two years to go back to, to the academy. And Hickson every day, come on, Pedro, let's go. Come on, Pedro. I said, no, you like, you like to grab guys. I like to grab girls, Hickson. That's my, uh, what I used to tell him. <laughs> so one day he asked me for a ride. I had my car parked in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the street. And it's like, hey, give me a ride to the academy. So... I gave him a ride to the academy when I was in front of a downtown Rio de Janeiro. There was a parking stall right there in front. So I go park my car and I told Hicks, I'm not going to do nothing. I already saw you guys doing this. It's not for me. No, no, don't worry, Pedrinho. Don't worry. Just come in. He used to call me Drope. Is my name backwards. Pedro Drope, you know? <laughs> so that's, that's how he used to call me. So I go to the academy. When I arrived there, was uh, Professor Grandmaster Elio Gracie was there sitting down at the front desk. Right when you walk in, was a front ta table there, a desk. And he gave me this, you know, shook my hand. I felt this little big shake, shaking hand. And he's like, so, Hickson, that's the guy you told me? And Hickson said, yeah, yeah, that's him. Oh, come on. Let's, I said, no, 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 I'm not going to train. Oh, yeah, you will. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not going to train. I already done. I already saw you guys doing I don't like the stuff. You guys grab stuff too much. I like to box it. Oh, you like to box, my son. Hold on a second. So he put two 16 ounces, those brown ounces gloves that you probably remember at the Grace Academy. <laughs> the leather ones. 
It was a big 16 ounces. And he, my gosh, uh, uh, Jean-Jacques, my first day of academy was the worst nightmare that I should, I should never go back to the academy. I honestly, I should never go back because I, I, I didn't get spank. I think I got worse than rape. <laughs> worse. Because Elio was the grandmaster. Elio was watching the train. He was telling, no, don't go again. I, came one time, I left the, the, the ring area. It was a little change room. It was a bathroom. Between the two rings, there was a little change room. I went to the toilet. I hugged the toilet, and I stayed there for like 40 minutes, having convulsions, throwing up, complete out of shape. Well, after that day, you know, I told Hicks, I said, Hicks, I need to learn this stuff. What is, how can I sign up? And Hicks was like, no, don't worry, brother. Don't worry, my friend. Next time, you come back here, Knox, next time. I said, no, 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 no. I got I to gotta learn this stuff. No way. And I got, I got spanked by Hoyler. I got spanked by Ed. Hoyler was the little thing, like this big, man. Nine years old, just walking my legs, put me down the ground. When I think I was, I was going to choke. I couldn't do anything. I was completely helpless. So I got a, a gi. Hickson gave me a gi as a long gi. And he told me, listen, if you keep training, this gi is yours. But if you stop training, you got to bring it back. And I still have the gi. And it's the name of the gi. is called Victor Vasconcelos. He's a very well-known surfer guy in, in, in Brazil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was his gi. <laughs> so that's my beginning of jiu-jitsu. And after that, uh, you know, I was pretty much in a private class, semi-private class every day for six hours because I got hooked. We all get hooked. You know, I fell in love with jiu-jitsu. You know, we all know that. We, we, jiu-jitsu is a complete addictive. So I got hooked, and I spent hours, and I got a chance to get mauled by Grandmaster Helio for hours and hours and hours every day. And he used to toy with me, Jean-Jacques. I cannot even tell you how Grandmaster Helio was. You remember. You remember how he was. We talk about this uh, choke. <laughs> I know. And, and Pedro, looking today, would you ever imagine today – the people that you train with, you have Hoyler, you have Hoyt, you have Hoka, you have Hickson. Would, would you, in a, I don't know, it's early, I know, but would you ever imagine you see all of those guys, what they've done with Jiu-Jitsu and how far? Exactly. Because uh, the amazing thing to me is you were part of that right in the beginning because they were your training partners. You're older than Hoyler and Hoyt and is it, it, I guess you're close age as Hickson, same age as Hickson. Yep. But it, it's incredible. How is, that, how is it like growing up in the Jiu-Jitsu Academy? Like few people had what you, what you had a chance to live. How is it, man? Like as you're growing up, getting older and older, and you see Hickson's transformation, you see being under Helio Gracie there, become a part of the family. Because I know you went many times to Itaipava, near Petrovic. Mm -hmm. To the to the, no situ. How, mm -hmm. is, how is that whole? Because I know Jiu Jitsu goes beyond the academy. It's yep, yeah, it was, things that you have afterward. It and, goes way beyond. And, and it was a good camaraderie. Uh, we used to compete a lot. Grandmaster Elio, as we re remember, he, he used to put us to fight all the time. But it was a very clean, very fair, very honest. We, we, we just respect each other. And, uh, and behind the jiu-jitsu was the social aspect that we belonged to a group that was, uh, you know, we take care of ourselves. We used to, you know, do exercise. I've never done that before in my life. And like, I, if I tell you, uh, if you see my dad and my grandpa, the body, body how my dad and my, uh, and my father and, and my grandpa, you know, when I started jiu-jitsu, I was 130 pounds. You know, I was so fragile. Uh, I have no muscles on my body. Uh, I'm not a guy who built uh, uh, muscle. I never have muscle. I've been, I was a uh, very wired person, but no muscle at all, no strength. So Grandmaster Elio, he kind of related to the lack of strength that I had, but I was, I was like a – I was crazy. I got to be honest. I was crazy. I, I no question about that. I was uh, – if you told me to, to do something or if you challenged me, I was like a complete fearless. And jiu-jitsu gave to me um, some kind of balance. It gave me like a, a ground where I can look at people when I talk about to be comfortable in my own skin. When I was a kid, I was not comfortable in my own skin because I believed that I was crazy. I, I, I used to believe 
that I was, uh, you know, I hear everybody tell me Pedro's crazy. I I listen to this to the in 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 the family. Oh, Pedro's crazy. Oh, it must be Pedro. Pedro's the one who done it. It was everything was Pedro. So I believe in that. And uh, what Elio, Grand Master Elio did for me, one time we were training, and uh, uh, Grand Master Elio got in the wrong position, and I was trying to escape, push and pull, push and pull, elbow escape, and I couldn't escape, I couldn't, I couldn't budge it. And uh, he looked at me and said, oh, you think you're crazy? And when he said that crazy to me, I, I kind of stopped and looked at him right in the eyes and said, what? And he looked at me, listen, you can trick your parents, but you don't trick me, you are full of crap. And you know that the moment on uh, Jean-Jacques, he was the first person who ever called me. And I discovered later that my mom told Elio, my mom and Elio end up to be very good friends. And by the way, they died on the same day. Man, how... Same day, same year. Yes, about yeah. four hours apart. Man, and my mom was a, was a very incredible, she was a spiritual, very, very incredible lady. She was, you remember Chico Xavier in Brazil? Yes, yes. Yeah, my mom was, you know, she was kind of belonged to the, to the group. She was, uh, uh, you know, do meetings. So Grandmaster Elio liked to, 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 do, to be on those meetings too. So my mom one day told Elio, say, oh, Pedro's crazy. Pedro does this. Pedro does that. Pedro's like this. My guy kicked out from every school. And Elio looked at my mom and said, Miriam, if I give Pedro a $100 bill, do you think you eat it or you put it in his pocket? And my mom like, oh, think, oh Elio, I think you put it in his pocket. I can still fix him. You watch out. And that's exactly what he did. Man. He called me in the, in the, right there. And when I, when I discovered that I could not trick Elio, that put me like, you know, put me in a, in a spot like, man, this guy is tough. Kick my butt. I don't trick him. He called all my stuff. So I, I started getting, I started giving a, a, a more respect to Elio. And, and he took me under his wing in a way because I was just too fragile. Just for you to imagine, when, when I was, um, when Hicks was a young, when we were young kids, Hickson decided to form his first competition team. Hickson Grace competition team. <laughs> and I say, sign me up. <laughs> I didn't have no idea. I, I was probably a white belt six months of class, maybe. Three, four, five, six months of Sign me up, Hickson. You know, how tough. Yeah. So I, 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 I went to compete at Halls at the Carson, uh, Carson Academy in, in, in um, Figueiredo Magalhães. Yes. And I fought against uh, Arthur Pardal, Pardalzinho. Yeah, 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 yeah. He beat the crap of me, man. He passed. So on the way to the to the on the way to the to the tournament, you know, Hickson, I was in the car, you know, so Hickson was giving me the hint. So Pedro, you do gonna do like this, you know, you, you put the hand on the collar, you put your foot over there, you put the guy in the guard. He was giving me all the hint. I was like, okay, put him in the guard, do this. So I got it. Don't worry. <laughs> Oh, man, Artur Pardal passed my guard 20 times, at least. But he didn't finish me. So when the, fa when the match was over, he was in a mount position, tried to squeeze my neck, tried to, tried to choke me, and I just hold on for dear life. And uh, when, when Halls kind of rung the bell and Artur got up, I just saw Hickson's face come right to my face like this, smiling. It's like, dude, what are you smiling for? Me? I just got, I got spanked over here. Man, you did awesome. This guy's a super tough guy. I was like, you son of a, you didn't have told me that. <laughs> oh, oh, that was funny. Man. And how, how was that car? Uh, when did you realize, because I remember in Brazil, as we get older, several years already training, did you ever realize one day you will be actually teaching jiu-jitsu? Because you go through that transition as a student, then we fight in tournaments. Some people go fight MMA, then mm -hmm. teaching, and a lot of people don't. When did you realize, like, you know, because when I met you, I don't know if a lot of people know, I, I remember you used to work in a stock market in Brazil. Yep. You know? And, um, and I, as I mentioned to you before, you already trained for so many years. One famous story that we all heard. I I don't recall exactly how it was, but I think someone tried to carjack you. Yep. Then you used the self-defense of jiu-jitsu and was able to save yourself and not allow the guy to take your car. That's true. That's you know that's what when I moved to America. When I decided to move to America it was right after that. 
and uh, and I was a uh, I was dropping my my niece at her house in Leblon, Rio de Janeiro. She got out of the car, uh, shut the door, but I didn't put the pin down. I didn't lock it, and uh, I was in a canal Le, canal do Leblon. Yeah, that's danger there, man. Very danger, dark, kind of remote. And uh, I just heard a noise, boom, I just, like, a big noise. When I saw it was a guy, was a big guy, just sitting down, like a big, like a, a lot taller than me, like over here, sitting down side by side with me. And he extended his arm like this, and he put a knife right against my neck over here. And he was holding the knife here, he was kind of shaking. He was kind of pretty nervous, and I can smell the, the breath of alcohol and drugs. It was, it was horrible. So... Uh, this guy starts saying, start praying, oh, you know, son of a gun, because I'm going to kill you. And I just, very quiet, very calm, say, hey, don't worry, my wallet is right there. I got a wallet right there. I got some cash there. And uh, uh, the guy go ahead and go reach for my wallet. And I was, I was still driving the car. So I hit the brake. And me, and uh, so, you know, when you brake, you kind of go a little bit forward. I hold this, the steering wheel, and I move myself back. And I saw his arm go from here to here. And I, I just kind of put my hand like this, and I lock uh, an Americana, and I broke his arm. Uh, I just broke his arm like a, like it was a big, was horrible broke because I was terrified, and I didn't, I didn't let go at all. You know, I broke his arm and I kept a broken arm in my hands, and I was holding his arm, his his wrist with my hand, and my other hand I was like this, just elbow, 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 and it was I don't even know how many, but I mean I, I was. It was horrible. It was blood everywhere. But knowing in Brazil that if we have to do that, unfortunately, to save our life. And, uh, but that, it's funny because that just went all around all these jiu-jitsu schools. Yep. Grandmaster wants, wants to do the global deals, uh, wants to put in the global because it was like, you know, jiu-jitsu, you know, was a good way to kind of demonstrate this feature. So, and I was a little stick, you know. You know, somebody of my size can do something like this. You know, that was great. What's, uh, what's the kind of message that William S. would like to do it? And let me ask you this too, Pedro. I know in, uh, it probably is more than few, but I would like to know if you will have one or, or that you can share for us. Something that the Grandmaster Helio Grace said to you that you carry on with you until today. I know it must be more than one thing, but things mm -hmm. that he mentioned to you, they said, you know, I always remember that. I will never forget that. Yeah, well, uh, I'm going to say, that, Jacques, I, I believe today, my personality that I have today is probably a big part was, was molded uh, when I was a kid during the time with uh, Grandmaster Helio and listen to all the advices, not just advices for life, but uh, he used to give both advice, you know, for the mat, for the, for the training, for the fight, and for the life. And uh, I got to be honest, uh, Elio was a very clever, very smart, very intelligent. Uh, and a couple of things, I remember so many stuff, but one thing that kind of stuck up with me, and it's very difficult to do it, and he used to say, try to live your life without never say maybe. Or yes, or no. Flat out. And that's a very tricky thing to do. Uh, you know, things like, you know, anything that we do, we do for life, like, you know, basically, the Grandmaster Elio was very respectful. And uh, he, I believe that he was trying to make, uh, put it in our minds, was to kind of believe in Jiu-Jitsu. Because I'm not sure if you remember, we believe in Jiu-Jitsu, but we didn't know how efficient Jiu-Jitsu was. Like, you know, how deep. We, we always kind of dressed the show. You know, we fought, we done everything. But going out of our box, we didn't know exactly, you know. Yes. Grandmaster, I used to tell, this is the best stuff. But I didn't know for sure. <laughs> I remember when I moved to, uh, I did a seminar in New, when I came to America. I did a seminar in Utah, South Lake City, Utah. And when I, when I, when I got back, I told Grandmaster, I said, ah, Grandmaster, I can't believe it. I, I tap everybody. I can't believe it. I, was, I, I got able to submit everyone. And I looked at me and said, Pedro, I've been telling you for... 20 years. This is the best. <laughs> <laughs> and for having, having a great life in Brazil with everything that you have and, uh, and I know being an academy with so many great competitors, champions, why 
and when you realize why moving to America and why in America you engage and start even more your jiu-jitsu and be, be more as an mm -hmm. amateur as you it is today. Yeah, you know, Jean Jacques, when, when I was, uh, uh, what happened at Hickson, when Hickson left Brazil, end of 1988, if I'm not mistaken, we spent almost a year without, I spent almost one year, I didn't see Hickson, I didn't saw Hickson at all for one year. And at that year, I went to teach Jiu-Jitsu at Corpo Quatro. Corpo Quatro. Corpo Quatro, uh, Alvaro Barreto and Silver Baron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what happened that uh, uh, when I decided to go there, Marcelo Baron took me there. Marcelo was a good Me and Marcelo, we were trained together. I I, when Marcelo came to the academy, he was riding a blue belt. And um, uh, we, I was the first guy who actually sparred with him. And, uh, you know, we did a nice man. We, we ended up to be buddies. We have training, buddy, training parts for more than 10 years. Uh, a, a, a great guy. So he took me to the grace to Copo Quatro. And uh, as a matter of respect, I went back to the Grace Academy, Grace Omaita, and I talked to Grandmaster Elio, saying, Professor, you know, uh, Grandmaster Alvaro Barreto is offering me an opportunity to teach class. He just came here to ask permission. And uh, Elio was like this, well, Pedrinho, if you want to teach Jiu-Jitsu, you should go to, he gave, I don't, no, I'm not going to mention name here because, he, you know, Elio was kind of rough. Here. You should go to this guy, you know, uh, one of the family, and yeah. you tell him that I send you there to teach him Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs> of course, I never did that. I never will. I never gonna say it. But that's Elio's uh, my device. Go there. So I, I I went there. You know, I, I talked to great guy. Was very friendly, very nice. But I end up to going back to Alvaro Barreto because Alvaro Barreto offered me a, a incredible deal. He offered me pretty much twice as much salary I was making, uh, not as a broker, but uh, uh, whatever the other school. The other school offered me a salary. Yeah. Grandmaster Albert doubled. He doubled my salary. So I spent one year at Copo Quatro. And what happened in Copo Quatro, by, I believe by lucky and maybe some kind of dedication, uh, I, was, I used to arrive at, uh, arrive at Copo Quatro every day at 3 o'clock, and I used to be there until almost 10 o'clock at night every day. We were fanatics at the time, so we spent six, seven hours on, on the academy every day. Well, uh, on the end of the year was a tournament in, in, in Niterói, and Copo Quatro did it very well, positioned very well, point-wise, a whole bunch of stuff. And Elio and Hickson was talking. Hickson was right in America. And uh, Elio talked to Hickson and said, yeah, Pedrinho is now teaching in this place. So, so you know, and, and Hickson, uh, Hickson, man, maybe Pedro would like to come to America. He's a very skinny guy. You know, might be something. So Hickson was teaching Chuck Norris at the time. He was to do private class with Chuck Norris. Yes. Do you remember it was uh, 1990, yes. <clears throat> beginning of 1990. So uh, and when Chuck went to Brazil in 1985, I was a brown belt. It was the day that I got my black belt. I got my black belt in 85. But uh, in 85, I was a brown belt at the time, and Chuck was doing a movie, a movie set, some kind of movie in, in Rio de Janeiro. And Chuck Norris, uh, Bob Wall... And Howard Jackson, yes. those three guys, yes. they, sh they went to the Grace Academy, and I ended up training with uh, Chuck. And, you know, I'm a light guy, and I, I train, you know, I'm not a, 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 I'm a de I don't get any spasm. I'm very calm training, and I'm very delicate. So apparently Chuck, Chuck liked it, and Hickson said, hey, do you remember the little skinny guy that was in Brazil that you wrote? Yeah, yeah, I remember. So that's how I came to America. Uh, Hicks will call me, hey, Pedro, want to come to America? I say, yes, I will. I dropped the phone, sold all my stuff there, and I came to America. And I went to live at Hickson's house, and I came with Elio. We, we came uh, uh, about two days apart, and uh, Hickson picked me up in the airport. Uh, we went to the beach right away. We started talking, and Hickson tried to fulfill all, you know, fill me up all the stuff. And he just told me, you know, Pedro, the only word that you need to know is do like this. <laughs> oh, do like this. Man. That's it. Start teaching the class. Pedro, let me ask you this too. Um, I think I can say that generations from the 80s, I think everyone say, and I do say to me, was the golden age of jiu-jitsu. And the reason I'm saying that is... <clears throat> What was learned at that time from 
Man, you go to the academy, look who's teaching the class. We have Grandmaster Ali Brady. Every day. And what that did was give us the principles and a lot of information in Jiu-Jitsu beyond the techniques only that allow us to do Jiu-Jitsu for the rest of our lives. It just exactly. such a like longevity. But we can continue to teach through generations. Mm -hmm. And we are able to as the day to day people come to us school, my school, we're able to teach them techniques. They go to the tournament and they do very well if they want to. Yep. What do you think was the difference from back in the time you learned jiu-jitsu and from the time the jiu-jitsu is today? You know, uh, I got a couple of thoughts here. Uh, one thing that I can tell without a doubt that uh, uh, people are gener generation of the 80s, so when we came under Elio Umbrella, we did jiu-jitsu in a little bit different uh, mentality. We remember, remember was, we, we used to be embarrassed to tap. Was tapping not allowed. Remember that? Yeah. We have to fight until the end. Tap was like, you know, oh, man, we did everything, but they didn't tap. Yeah, this guy, you know, he kicked my butt, but he didn't tap. Remember? So yeah. what happened that generation at that time brought that kind of mentality of pride and, and, and a lot of, you know, honor. We had a lot of kind of, hey, you've got to represent – we can, hey, not going to turn me down, man. Don't, not going to embarrass me. You know, that was, that was in, 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 it was kind of brought up with us, with, with, this, with the knowledge of the, the techniques and mechanics. But the most important, I believe that the people that in, in, in that generation, we understood jiu-jitsu. We didn't practice just jiu-jitsu. We start to understand how to apply jiu-jitsu, when to apply, where to apply, we understood the philosophy. We understood more the, the strategy. And I think that's something that's missing today for a lot of people. It's like, man, yeah, a lot of people do jiu-jitsu. But we need to understand uh, when to do, when not to do, when to hold your horses, when to kind of, you know, you to win. When we understand this, that's the different, that, I think that's one of the, uh, a big change for Elio Grace generation. And Hickson, look at Hickson today, you know, all the invisible jiu-jitsu, he, he, he understands you just in a different way. He can pass you just different. It, it's just the understanding. It's the only thing that I believe that's a little bit different. I think, I think it's also, we're not just learn jiu-jitsu. I think we leave jiu-jitsu. Yes. We, we, we pass that stage of learning to leave. With exactly. Us every day, I teach my kids and all the relations that I have, my wife and everyone, it's based on, the knowledge of jiu-jitsu, you know, I think mm -hmm. we carry that on our skin. Exactly, and exactly. Pedro, how, how was it the beginning of jiu-jitsu for you in America? Because um, you went to with Hickson, then I remember you taught at the Grace Academy, then you end up moving to Utah and opened the school. How was that beginning? I know with the challenge of not speaking much English, <laughs> there was no English at all. But we made it, you know? Yep, it was unbelievable. I was just do like this. <laughs> how, how is that for you? Because there's so many of us that on that time when it came in, there was no, no knowledge of Jiu-Jitsu anywhere. I mean, we had to show people without speaking the language what we have is gold. Exactly. And how was that challenge in the beginning there? Difficult because was a time that a lot of big guys come to your place to challenge you. Huge guys, Utah. It is the biggest people you ever gonna come across in your life because over there is the Mormon. You know the Mormon they yeah, dominate yeah. The, the the state, and and Mormons they don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't they they very healthy, and the prophet of the Mormon church, Joseph Smith, he was a he was a, a wrestler. So every kid in Utah does do wrestling. And over there, I ended up meeting Mark Schultz, that was uh, the BYU coach for the BYU uh, University. Yes. And ended up to be a great friend of mine, one of the incredible, very unbelievable, nice guy. Uh, one of the toughest men I've ever come across in my life. Uh, uh, unbelievable. Uh, Mark Schultz is uh, like a, as a species. Yeah. I've I seen this guy doing things, uh, 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 Jean-Jacques, that I, is even... I, I'm embarrassed even to talk about it. It's unbelievable. And, and, and how, how was that challenge like from 
from you to move and, and end up establish your school. And today you're at Virginia, right? But how was that? Because uh, I know everywhere I go, man, I see someone representing you, Pedro Sauer. Yep. Right here. It's so yep. Cool. I think you are, you are one of the, uh, the, the instructors that has more affiliation everywhere. How yeah, we that? have like a... It's, it's man. Yeah. You know what happened, just like right in the beginning, I met a guy from the East Coast, Frank Cucci. He yeah. used to run an academy in, in Virginia Beach. And he was a Navy SEAL. And uh, when I met Frank, uh, you know, we kind of hit it very well. And uh, I started coming to Virginia Beach uh, and spend every month one week. And I did this for many, many years. And what happened that Frank wants to, man, I want to start an affiliation. I want to, I want to, and um, I decided to do it like a curriculum. Yes. You know, I, what I did, I, I got together with one of my students. His name was Jeff Curran. And we just, you know, let's, one, one, one camera, just one camera. And I say, Jeff, grab like this. And I do the self-defense. Jeff, grab like that. Well, we spent two days. Jeff knows everything. Uh, uh, hours and hours and hours. We put a hundred and, 176 moves self as a curriculum. Self-defense. And that's the beginning of the association. So today we have 150 schools that they're affiliated. And uh, one thing that's been, uh, always been my personality, always been my, you know, my desire, because that's myself. Uh, since the day one, I, I don't have enemies. I don't have people that I say, wow, I hate this guy, or I don't like, I, I, I don't know. If I, I do, met, I have no idea. <laughs> I never met anyone that did not say good things about you. Or <laughs> does not like everyone. It's, you're very... Yeah, when people are talking about you, Pred, everywhere, it's really to the highest. Really, really cool, man. I appreciate it, man. You know, that's, I, I, that's, my, that's my, my mom. You see, what I did for Jesus, my mom and Elio, both those two together, that's where pretty much where it kind of molded my, my life in, in my Jesus kind of career. Yeah. And uh, when, when, when I did the, the affiliation and it started growing, you know, uh, with the program, what I did, I put like, you know, 10 years mark. I say, I want to see people getting black belts in 10 years, give and take. I'm not here every day, so I cannot see you every day. So it's going to be 10 years, give and take. And I did that, and I set up a rule and regulations for everybody. And I remember Mark Schultz, that was an unbelievable uh, nightmare. I uh, know the guy was wearing a blue belt. He can tap any black belt. He was a monster. Like a mean monster, and I told Mark, "I'm sorry. This is guy. This is is guideline. Yeah, yeah. You know guidelines. And well, today I got a close to 200 black belts that been in in this kind of proceed. Like no, every single one. They have to be 10 years give and take. You know, and I I tell people today it's um, a lot of great fighters out there, champions, but it's like. In two years, they reach out the black belt, less than 10 years. And what I try to explain to people is this, look, you have a book with 12 chapters. This guy just read two. I mean, the problem is when he opens the school, he doesn't have the rest of the knowledge that needs to be learned to be able to teach jiu-jitsu exactly. the proper way. And because a lot of schools today grow up in the competition system, they're making everything shrinking. And the problem is yeah. a lot of great fighters out there, unbelievable, but they've never read the rest of the book, you know? And thinking about all those years that it takes to get into a black belt, so many things we learn every day in the school. You never uh, stop. Yeah, and until today, I'm still it's learning not... every day. Unbelievable. But is that... They don't read the whole book. They just nope. read two chapters. Oh, I know. No, it's a lot more to be learned in Jiu-Jitsu. That's true. And you know, when you, when you go to this part, Jean-Jacques, when you, when you, when you kind of, uh, uh, let's imagine you achieve a level of a champion, competition champion, you're a very, very top-notch guy. But if you, don't, if you don't act, if you don't kind of, you know, if you don't put some kind of social benefits in this environment, what happened that we are just teaching people how to be a tough guys, fighters. Uh, the social benefit, the social improvement, in my personal view, is one of the most important and has to be associated with the progress of jiu-jitsu. 100%. You know, 
because that's the way that you build longevity. And look at right now, how many people are in such a need of the extension of jiu-jitsu outside the school, outside yep. the net. And hopefully, and a lot of people that are seeing there understand that jiu-jitsu goes beyond the dojo. And right now, especially, we all need that to be conscious of that aspect, to learn and use the jiu-jitsu on every day. And I tell people, man, jiu-jitsu teaches to care about others. Exactly. So people come to your school, you're teaching somebody, and you, we know now that, man, I'm going to change this person's life for better. Exactly. You know? We, we have this ability. It's incredible, man. And when, when we do have, when, you, when we offer this to our students, we bring the, the social benefits, we bring the, you know, the, the, phys the physicality, the moral. When you add all those values, we build longevity. Today, those 200 black belts that I made, 90% is still active. They don't, talk, they don't stop. The age is not, a, is not a problem for you to stop. You know, uh, I saw Grandmaster Elio when I met him. He was my age. He was six years old. And I was socialized with Grandma Sally until he, you know, 95. And 92, he tried to kick my butt. <laughs> we, we have this on video. One day I got to release that. He mounted me. He tried to beat me flat out. 92 years old. Yeah, that's it. You know, you know exactly what I'm talking about, huh? <laughs> you remember he used to carry a little bag with him? And I think inside that bag, I think he had a gun with <laughs> it was something else, man. I know. I remember going to his house, and he was in a 12 gauge. Arriving his house in in in, in Taipava. Do you remember the dog they used to have there, the Boomer? Boomer, yeah. My Who gosh. Dog I've ever seen my life. It was a the dog looked like a like a cow. It's like a humongous. I never see a dog that big. And he was a mean dog too. He was aggressive. He he was not a friendly one. No, but you know. That's the kind of log, dog he likes. I know. And remember, he shot the dog. He, he shot him twice. Remember that? He put two, two bullets. And the dog did not die. Didn't die. So I remember going to his house and, and have to be facing Boomer. Man. Biting the, 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 the mirror of my car. He tried to rip the mirror of the car. Uh, and, and I said, I'm not going to get out of the car here. I said, no way. So Grandmaster Elio, he did have a... a he was a character, but he, he knew exactly what he was doing. He built an incredible, you think about the people that study with Grandmaster Elliot, yourself, uh, Hickson, Horton, Helson, uh, everybody, the Machados. Think about the people that kind of got to, to know him. They, everyone is still pretty, pretty active, and, uh, and everyone is still pretty, uh, you know, helping and doing a lot of great work with Jiu Jitsu. You have that determination, the discipline, and that's what I'm saying is all these people from that 80s, they, they had such a longevity in the jiu-jitsu that I know I'm going to train jiu-jitsu until, until the day I die. I have no problem, you know? Pedro, let me ask you this. Uh, what jiu-jitsu means to you? Well, jiu-jitsu means one of the most intelligent forms of uh, martial arts, that's the uh, one. But in, I believe that we can mold people personality-wise to be better humans. I believe that when people tr come to jiu-jitsu and they start to understand the reality of the, the uh, negotiation that we have to do with our bodies, negotiation that we have to do with our thoughts, the, uh, the lack of patience that sometimes can come up towards us or sometimes way too much patience. When you start balancing all this, down the road, I believe that this prepare us for longevity, prepare us for, to face life. And I think this is an easy question. Who, who is Pedro Sauer? <laughs> I'm the most simple guy you're ever going to meet in your life. I'm a carpenter, mechanic, plumber. Like cars? I, I think you like I do cars. Me I, I can drive. I can do... I, I can do anything. I, I, can you believe that I, I do seminars? Uh, you know, I've been doing seminars for 30 years, pretty much every weekend. I can never walk in a bathroom without cleaning the bathroom. And I mean full clean. And I say this uh, honestly because I learned this from Grandma Sally. I know. 
I know. I walk in any bathroom, can be any place, anywhere, public bathroom, doesn't matter. I'm going to clean it. And uh, I think it's, those are one of the things that shows that we do care about others. You know? Yep. It shows that we're no better than anybody. You know, we love what we do. And I, I think you know now more than ever that we feel that we have a mission in our hands because uh, what was passing on, now I'm able to pass on to make the difference in so many millions of people's life there. And like everyone, I was reading that to you, Pedro, is, uh, you are someone that is one of the most like likable person that I have seen in our jiu-jitsu community. Thank you, man. Everyone from what we can call enemies or rivals, they only have good things to say about you. Thank you, man. Uh, I know you for all this time and hear the stories and uh, going back in time in Brazil. A lot of things that I spoke with Higgs about it, to see that how loyal you are, how respect, how how incredible person you are. Thank you, Amigo. That's one of the why why Pedro's everybody loves Pedro so much as you do for you <laughs> so well. And I appreciate it. Easy, easy explanation, man, for you know, the way you are, the way you conduct yourself. You still being an, an as example for all of us. An amazing student, fighter, doctor now, and uh, knowing that how important it is to use jiu-jitsu to benefit the others. I okay, appreciate now, it. Muito, It's the same with you, amigo. Muito obrigado pela sua oportunidade, pô. Uh, stay safe, né? Um prazer, meu amigo. Vamos, vamos, vamos voltar em breve. Vamos sim, cara. Obrigado mesmo. Pô, tudo de bom e daqui a pouco a gente vai estar junto conversando mais próximo. Maior Obrigado, prazer, né, Jack? Pô, tudo de bom para você, meu irmão. Um beijo no coração. Olha, saúde para você, tudo de bom. Muita saúde para a família toda. Continue sendo esse exemplo aí, né, Jack? Você também é uma pessoa que todo mundo te quer, te quer muito bem. Pô, muito obrigado, Pedrão. E em breve, vamos estar juntos. Valeu. Se Deus quiser, meu amigo. Pô, fica com Deus, cara. Obrigado. Obrigadão, né, Jack? Saúde para você. Um abração. Tudo de bom para a rapaziada toda ouvindo aí. Um grande abraço Valeu, e obrigado cara. pela oportunidade, hein, irmão? Ó, oh, vamos ter que fazer outro em português, tá? Todo mundo pedindo português. <risos> vamos fazer isso, o áudio que você quiser. Abraço, obrigado, Pedro. Obrigado, Jean-Jacques. Saúde, irmão. Tudo de bom. Abraço aí, rapaziada. Valeu. Tchau, tchau.